Well, good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak. I wasn't originally intending to give a, a talk or presentation, but a combination of, of two events and persuasion from Adrian uh, has led me to come up with what is not really a talk, it's a, a kind of work in progress based upon a combination of two events. First of all, becoming... Um, through his, his recent uh, sad death, the uh, death of Guy Lyon Playfair, I'm his executor and literary executor and currently sorting out his estate and his records and archives. And before he died, all but what we were discussing paranormal phenomena right up until a day, day or two before he actually died in April. Uh, his, his interest never waned and we had to, we were discussing we've discussed poltergeists together for years and years and years and i was i was in touch with adrian about this and also happened to get onto another subject uh, about what were guy playfair's last thoughts on the subject of poltergeist activity and i ended up um, discussing with with adrian um, possession and Really, this talk should be understood as poltergeists and possession. There is an overlap, but I'm going to be addressing two, the two areas. First of all, poltergeists. Guy Lyon Playfair, as you'll all know, was a veteran investigator of poltergeists over some 45 years. January this year, I had a discussion with him. It was Earl's Court Flat. What do you think they are, really? And we kind of went through the history and the list. And um, rather surprisingly, Guy says, after 45 years, I'm still as puzzled by aspects of the phenomena and what is behind it as I was when I started. And he then shared with me just the latest line of inquiry he was taking. And what something else that Guy Playfair said, however, when we come on to the, this subject more widely, is very true. In his 1980 book, This House is Haunted, on the Enfield poltergeist, he said, mention spirits and the audience get, becomes polarised. It goes between extreme sceptics and extreme believers. And somehow or other, you have to try and negotiate your way down the middle. And... Over the years, there have been many theories about poltergeists. We touched on poltergeist phenomena in, in the last session. The question of evidence uh, was alluded to by John Fraser, and uh, I made a point some years ago that if we use the same legal tests as we convict people on in the courts, we, these things are proved beyond reasonable doubt, using something called similar fact evidence, where there is striking similarities between reported phenomena year in, year out, thousands of miles apart, centuries apart. If we apply the same tests, we have got similar fact evidence with poltergeists. Uh, the, I tried to make this point back in 2015 to The Guardian when the Enfield haunting uh, was being televised, a three-part mini-drama, but I'm afraid they, they found my line. Uh, I, I, I got a bit annoyed with the, the rather sceptical questioning, and I said, look, if we are, we're talking about evidence in poltergeists, I said there, there is more evidence for the Enfield poltergeist than there is for what we've just locked up Rolf Harris for, a series of historic section fences. Well, they did not print that. But if we, if we nonetheless use the same tests as we send serial murderers and sex offenders to court, then you know, these things are proved. And Adrian as well actually touched upon the problem of evidence. In poltergeist cases, the problem is the surfeit of evidence. It's not that there's a lack of it, there is just simply too much. It's not just simply witness statements. We also, to really cut to the chase, we have forensic evidence. We have fires, we have damage to objects, we have all the things that actually turn up in crimes uh, which are tested, examined in the courts, on a daily basis and we are able to reach standards of proof which are, and evidence which are not always correct. Verdicts are wrong, juries are wrong and so on, but it's the best system we've got. 
for events that happen outside laboratory conditions. And if we use the same sort of techniques as we use in, say, proving cases of domestic violence or abuse of children or really some of the most serious offences, we have got a level of evidence in well-observed poltergeist cases which exceeds that that many people are being sent to jail on. And the problem is, although we've been looking at these things for centuries, recording them, and many of the old cases are very well um, documented in, the, in their own way, sometimes ahead of the ones that are circulating today, there's never been a catch-all comprehensive theory. And this is what Guy and myself um, were discussing, that if we actually go through the history, we can see we can see a range of theories that have come, come and gone over the centuries. Pre-1550, poltergeists were believed to be the spirits of the dead. 1600 to 1700, demons and witchcraft. Now, immediately, again, like the word spirits, it's polarising. People have all kinds of ideas about the witchcraft era, uh, the, particularly that the cases that went before the courts uh, and, and the whole witch hunts was an atmosphere of hysteria. It was, it was mass psychosis. Um, you know, the, the popular view from the 19th century is it was superstition of the church and it was people who were uh, obsessed with the idea of witches having a witch hunt. You look through what remain of the trial records. The trials are ponderous in the extreme. They tested the evidence. In the end, it's actually the judiciary applying the rules of evidence that say, well, we cannot accept the, the evidence of children and women. There's sexism, gender issues here as well. But in the end, it's, it's legal evidential tests that kick out the idea of witchcraft. But the phenomena that are being described in many cases, although witchcraft, witchcraft was found not to be an explanatory theory, the, the evidence, however, in these cases is actually often very well observed and then depending on the perspective you take in the supposedly advanced 20th and 21st century, you are seeing conditions, medical conditions, psychiatric ones, which were not understood at the time, not really understood today, but you can recognise things that make perfect sense, but the overall picture, the framework was incorrect. We move on to the 1840s, belief in witchcraft has died out, but we have accounts of what they call electric girls. These are girls, they, they're ascribing poltergeist phenomena to the early ideas of electromagnetism. We get Frank Podmore in 1896, Society for Psychical Research, still the author of the most detailed sceptical critique I've been able to find of poltergeist cases. Podmore actually went out and did research. But his overall impression, he, or the, the model he put forward, in, again, and there was a big debate in the SBR with um, people like Andrew Lang and Sir William Barrett about poltergeist activity. Podmore basically said, it's naughty girls. It's not particularly naughty girls. He did not like women, it must be said. <laughs> One of his, his lines is, there are enough naughty little girls on this planet already. He, 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 he seems to have been somewhat biased against women, um, to say the least. Then um, we get the idea of the teenager. Adolescence as an idea, as a kind of um, clinical, physical state, arises in the early 20th century. Herbert Carrington, who um, comes up with his ideas of life force, overflowing, blossoming, pubescent teenagers with excess sexual energy, creating these strange manifestations. We get the Eleanor Zugan case, um, which was shown, which is a girl, Romanian poltergeist girl, who ascribes it to a possessing entity she calls Dracu from the devil. We get Nanda Foda stepping in in 1938, which is the, the case, Thornton Heath case, that John referred to. He's, he's gone from a belief in spirits to full-blown Sigmund Freud. He actually turns up on Sigmund Freud's, by then a refugee in London's, doorstep to hand over his, his file. And this is, this is his great meeting with Sigmund Freud, who says, says thank you very much.
theories carry on. Theories carry on. Um, as a riposte to Freud, uh, John Layard comes up with uh, unconscious Jungian unconscious projections. Then we get the physical theories of SPR um, researcher and secretary Guy Lambert, that it's geophysical forces, it's tides and earthquakes. We then get William Roll, uh, the Seaford Island disturbances. He comes up with recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. We then have Maurice Gross and uh, Guy Lyon Playfair, the Enfield case, also work by Ian Stevenson, 1972 paper, and Alan Gould, who start to say, well, actually, one can make a case for discarnate involvement in poltergeists, spirits, or some kind of entity. And more recently, we get um, a case not far from here, a few miles away from Newcastle, the South Shields case of 2006, which eventually so freaks out the two investigators, they come up with a novel theory of an arch poltergeist, a kind of cosmic villain, something out of, rather like uh, the end of Tessa de Urbervilles, one of the immortals meddling in human affairs, and that there is this vast cosmic poltergeist. It's really just one super poltergeist dipping into human affairs. In fact, um, Darren Ritson has, has dropped out of psychic research almost altoge altogether. I did, did try to encourage him to come along to the, the conference, but he's, he's moved on to calmer areas like local history, whereas uh, his, his fellow investigator, Mike Halliwell, was so freaked out by what, what he encountered, he has embraced Islam. And he has gone from a, a North American Indian spirituality perspective to becoming a full-blown full Muslim convert. And it's a result of his experiences with poltergeist activity. Finally, there was the last discussion I had with Guy Plank. best describe it as ultra-terrestrials. He was in touch with Dr. Jack Varley, probably the, the world's, certainly the, the, the world's most serious um, ufologist, uh, astrophysicist, computer scientist, has been looking into ufology since the mid-1960s. And he was in email correspondence discussing the possibility of poltergeist activity having some kind of extraterrestrial flying saucer again is one of these prejudiced words um, gets people going let's call them ultra terrestrials something else entirely um, guy was prepared to look into all these theories he he, he moved between the need to per, uh, pursue the subject in terms of physics was his particular wish where he would like to see research going in terms of looking at the evidence from a a physics perspective, to also accepting the possibility of discarnate involvement. But where does this discarnate involvement come from? Now, if, uh, say, 10, 12, 15 years ago, been interested in the subject for a long time, I had to plump which theory fitted my view, I'd have gone for 1957 recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. Basically, poltergeists are energy coming out of the unconscious mind uh, or linked to the unconscious mind, causing physical effects around us. This, is the, this in many ways, is, is the important thing from an evidential point of view, is that psychokinesis is, cannot be ascribed purely to subjective, uh, subjective information processing patterns. It's not all in the mind. It's suggesting the mind is actually outside and it's leaving physical traces. There is objective evidence to make sense of it. But I, my view was very much, it was you know, the, the typical model of the troubled adolescent or the troubled older person. I have to say though, and I'm, I'm not keen on this theory myself, but we have to follow where the evidence is going. I can say that in at least three of the of these cases of poltergeist activity, well-documented multiple phenomena, I am reaching the conclusion that very much Maurice Gross reached and Guy Playfair, that this cannot simply be ascribed to the mind of the living, that there is some other uh, 
influence involved, which may or may not be a spirit. And I don't, I don't actually think spirit is necessarily a helpful term, but it suggests something discarnate, something else beyond the, literally the, the, the physical body and presence of the, of the individual. And even, you know, the unconscious mind, what do we mean by it? We, well, we don't really understand the unconscious at all. It's a term as well, but it's, I'm suggesting that in some of these cases, you start to get the impression that there is actually something beyond. The Enfield case uh, is, is the first one. Earlier than that, I've been looking to a case uh, for a number of years now, which occurred in Battersea, 1956 to 1968, a long-running poltergeist case. Uh, 12 years of activity, which involved particularly the production of letters. Now, to an extent, it doesn't really matter if the letters, in, on one level, were all faked. I, in the sense that they were written by a living person. To me, the writing resembles that of automatic writing at certain points. The story does come over as, frankly, unbelievable that a poltergeist writes letters. In fact, it doesn't just write a few letters, it writes three to 4,000 uh, letters over a 12-year period. And we, there are just stacks of these things which have survived on top of a lot of other, much better well-witnessed typical poltergeist effects, rats, object movements, fires, and so on. So something very strange was going on, on some level, and with the, 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 the deemed focus of it was a lady um, who's now 76, and she is convinced it was an external um, entity. It is hard to, hard to actually um, say it was her, and the personnel in, in the house change over the years. It's hard to pinpoint any one person who was there for the whole 12 years, who may have been responsible. It may, may have been a, a huge group effect, who knows? But certainly I, I can come to the conclusion that there is something strange going on there. And more recently, with the South Shields case, 2006, Darren Ritson, uh, Mike Hallowell investigated this case. They went in with ideas that were very much modeled on this house is haunted, the Enfield poltergeist, and came away really quite freaked out by the whole business and convinced that uh, poltergeist activity had actually followed them. They came into other cases where they began to see similarities and they came to the conclusion that it was not confined simply, whatever was going on in the house, to the, fam uh, the family concerned. I wanted to check their evidence. I went to see it myself. Again, the problem was the surfeit of it. They had just too many, they had too much material. Uh, they didn't even realize what they'd actually got because there were some quite unbelievable uh, descriptions of certain events in the book on one level. In the background of some of their photographs, they had not realized they had captured things which seemed to at least corroborate their version of events. One of them was about a plastic chair that uh, became distorted and then somehow or other went back into its own shape. And where's the photographs that any of this happened? Well, actually, in the background, you can spot things like this. They were actually trying to photograph something else. They came away convinced that there was some other presence. I'll put it no strongly. Now, where, where, where does this get us? Well, we have to be very careful, again, before we start using a word like possession or even worse, demonic possession or spirit possession. But this was the second sort of area of exchange I was having um, with, with Adrian, uh, talking about what's actually happening in the UK today, uh, in particular in our court system, in cases of often very serious crimes. Now, I have started doing some research using a database called LexisNexis. LexisNexis uh, is a kind of supercomputer base used by successful lawyers. QCs will say, I don't win my cases, Lexis wins them for me. And it's got a century and a half of court judgments, uh, authorities of all the higher courts are all on this supercomputer base which has been built up since 1978. 
costs over £100 an hour to use it, but I've managed to get some free access to it. So out of curiosity, rather than looking up things on local government law as, as I want, I started to look up words like devil, demon, possession. And what I found, I have to say, was perhaps curious, also disturbing. 90% of references to the devil or demons in English court judgments, and certainly the higher courts, over the last few centuries, I thought the search would be, oh, this would turn up 17th century, you know, 18th century, certainly a long time ago. In fact, 90% of references to the devil or the de or demons or spirits or possession, Satan, occur in legal cases in this country since 1974. And someone mentions, oh, it's the effect of the exorcist. Well, I don't think it is in itself. Um, the, uh, my, my standard argument for people say it was the, an exorcist effect. Yes, the, the, the film The Exorcist, the book, is the most... Well, certainly the film is among the top ten grossing supernatural films of all time. Gross on many levels, but it's a box office set success. More people have watched that worldwide than any other film about the supernatural. Yet, in the 45 years since it was released, the SBR has not been presented with one case of projectile green vomiting or one case of a woman pleasuring herself with a crucifix. So, the effect is not not from the film itself, but what is going on, and the rise has actually been since about the year 2000, we have got an increasing number of cases which are going before the higher courts, uh, even to the House of Lords, now the Supreme Court, looking at some of the basic definitions of what it is to be insane. And these cases arise from, yeah, arrive from claims of possession, in a background of people who claim they are possessed, or in other cases trying to kill or drive out demons in others. And the cases just are on the increase. And in the, I mean, given it, I had, there was one actually just down the road from where I live in Bournemouth. I live in a uh, suburb of Bournemouth called Pokesdale. On the 9th of January 2016, a 32-year-old woman called uh, Claire Winslade walked a five-year-old boy into the sea and tried to drown him. She was trying to sacrifice, um, fortunately she was stopped, she tried, was trying to sacrifice this boy in order to revive her dead father, whose cremation ashes she was carrying, and br bring the spirit of the boy into the ashes to bring father back to life. Fortunately, she was stopped by dog, dog walkers and joggers on the beach. She stood trial in November 2016 and was found not guilty by reason of insanity and sentenced to a hospital order. It is not the only case of its type. One, I mean, this is the subject of a much longer talk, but there has been case after case, the courts are having to look at the, um, case, the meaning of self-defense again. Uh, people who are producing psych psychotic symptoms who are saying it's demons, it's devils, it's spirits. It's, pretty, it's, it's turning up too regularly. Psychiatrists do not have a comprehensive model, and this is what lawyers spend their time arguing about. Do we have an exclusive British problem here? Is one question to ask at, at an international conference. I do say you have to be careful, though, before you run in and label anything as spirits, possession, demons, because a number of the cases I've been talking about also involve people standing trial for their attempts to get rid of spirits, demons and devils, where they end up killing the patient or the sufferer as well. Again, this is a modern phenomenon. If we look back before the, Second, uh, before the Second World War, really before 1974, these cases aren't in, at least are not in the courts. So on this, um, I'm being indicated it's time to, to wind up. I hope uh, I haven't wound anyone up too much. It's simply a collection of presentation of a work in progress and some notes and hopefully a little bit of food for thought.
Thank you very much.